Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Disney's live-action Aladdin, a remake of its 1992 animated film, has finally arrived in theaters. But will it overcome the tale's complicated history? Today, we also get up close and personal with Cypriot British musician Eylem and visit a new museum next to the Statue of Liberty in New York, raising questions about the meaning of freedom in today's America, but first. Women artists. It's difficult to realize that half a century ago. Have never gotten the serious attention and certainly not the serious money that male artists do. From Baroque times to the present day, we tell you about the long overlooked role female artists have played throughout history. Religion, um, community identities, the preservation of language, the idea of uh, note-taking and memorialization. Is the pen mightier than the sword? The British Library's new exhibition looks at the whens, whys and hows of humanity's relationship with writing. For at least the last 5,000 years, people have been putting hammer to stone ink to parchment and pen to paper. And while it is a universal form of communication as well as storytelling that we use every day, how often do we stop to consider why and how writing came to be so central to human life? What better place to find the answer than at London's British Library? Showcase's Miranda Atti went there to see the writings on the wall for herself. So the need for accountancy, the need for talking uh, to those beyond the grave uh, in the afterlife, and also the idea of uh, naming and claiming things as being an important reason why people put down marks to show their ownership or the uh, naming of a particular region or place. These are just some of the reasons humans started writing, according to British Library curator Michael Erdman. Along with a team of experts, he's put together more than 100 items that range from the Mesoamerican era to the future, via China, Iran, and many others. This stone stealer is the largest item in the exhibition, and it's on display for the first time ever. It's also one of the oldest, dating all the way back to 647 AD. Reaching more than two meters in height, these hieroglyphs tell the true story of Kak Uti Chan, a Maya ruler in Belize. The exhibition asks us to consider changing materials from stone to parchment and from quill to pen. There are also examples of religious texts, including different versions of the Quran. We got a 17th century Quran from Iran with uh, dual lines of the, of the holy book. It has in Arabic, in Nasr, uh, and in Persian, in Nastalik, to show different calligraphic styles that were employed in the Islamic world and that were developed to high points of calligraphy uh, throughout the years of uh, Islamic development and uh, cultural expansion in the region. One thing is made clear as you go through the exhibition, the power of writing in binding communities together. The urge to record and inscribe things is something that connects us all. It's a way to preserve language and customs. But what about in the future, as everything is digitized? In the future, writing might change. It might look different. We might use different technologies. But it's always going to be there as a way for us to express ourselves in one way or another. This is an ambitious exhibition from the British Library, which usually focuses more on books or themes rather than the materials used to create them. But it's an important one too, asking us to consider how methods of writing may have changed over thousands of years, while the idea behind it, that of communication, remains constant. Writing Making Your Mark is on until August. Miranda Atty, TRT World. London. Did you know 
that 87% of the permanent collections of 18 major art museums and galleries in the United States consist of works by male artists. And while only 5% of artists in the modern art sections of museums are women, 85% of the nudes displayed in those same spaces are female. So is this because only men are capable of aesthetic greatness or could it be that for centuries the art world has been unwilling to accept the intellectual and creative authority of female artists? Art historian and curator Flavia Frugheri is answering those questions in her most recent book titled Women Artists. By featuring 50 of them, ranging from the Baroque era to today, the book is helping reframe female contributions to the history of art, not as objects, but rather as creators. Equipping readers with an all-round understanding of art history, this compilation is giving women like Artemisia Gentileschi, the Guerrilla Girls, Cindy Sherman or Mona Hatum the long overdue recognition they deserve. Now, to help us deconstruct some of the art history's male-dominated grand narratives, historian and curator Flavia Frigeri joins me. Hi Flavia, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. So I know it's uh, probably one of the most famous and important questions of feminist art history, but I want to hear your take on it. How do you answer this question? Why have there been no great women artists? I mean, why is the category of genius confined to male artists? Well, I think uh, really the issue has been that women have not, in many senses, um, allowed to really emerge as fully-fledged artists. And this has to do really with uh, society and the conditions in which they were put. And I'm thinking here, especially in the past, um, women were obviously, the demands on them were to be um, housewives, to be mothers, and thus the pri priorities were others. Uh, their role as artists and contributors to art was always put to one side. And these artists, how did they work? I mean, did they use pseudonyms or were they anonymous? Um, in some cases, I mean, they chose to change their names um, to either very gender-neutral sounding names, as for instance, the pop artist Evelyn Axel, she went by Excel. Um, and her purpose with that was to be intentionally confusing. You would read the name and don't quite know whether it was a woman or a man. Um, and that's, that really enhanced her chances of exhibiting her work. Um, in other cases, women stuck to their own names, but obviously there was always this bias towards women as if they were almost like this inferior category of artists. It was almost people would look at their names first and then at their art and really judge them on their gender um, and not on what they were producing. I mean, I might sound a bit naive here, but I wonder why is it so hard for people to accept the fact that women as well created, painted, sculpted great works of art? Um, so I think, you know, um, you're touching here on really a key question, the one um, around why is it so hard for society to accept the presence of women and um, women were contributing um, across the board, you know, in terms of art, but also literature, writing, they were present, but the issue was recognizing their presence. I think that's really what we're being asked to do now and especially when we look back on artists from the Renaissance, from the Baroque, who were really present all along the way but very often they were working in the background and their names are still being brought to the fore. They were maybe, you know, in, at the times, and I'm thinking here of the Renaissance, the Baroque, there were many women working in famous artists' workshops, but because of their gender, um, they weren't really recognized for their work. I mean, take Italian uh, Baroque painter Artemisia Gentileschi, for example. It took centuries for art historians to recognize her paintings as hers, not her father's, although she actually signed them. Well, I mean, Artemisia is probably these days one of the most uh, famous and widely recognized artists. Last year, the uh, National Gallery purchased uh, a work of hers here in London. It went on view. It's currently on, on a tour. And it was really felt like something that 
um, should be done, and she is part of our history and um, needs to be represented. But as you rightly point out, it wasn't always that the case. Um, for a long time, she was very much overshadowed by her father. And this is just one example of many women who were overshadowed either by their fathers or by their husbands. And why did you think it was a good time now in 2019 to publish this book? Right now, you know, we're speaking more about, uh, and think I'm thinking here of Me Too and also, you know, of recent conversations about women's rights, we're thinking more about the place of women in society. And for me, it was important to show the place that women held in society in terms of arts. Um, and I felt you could really do that only by covering the arc from, you know, the more historical women to the more contemporary ones. Flavia Frigeri, thank you so much for shedding some light on this issue for us today. The glitz and glamour of showbiz can make anyone feel the heat of the spotlight at some point in their career, but not for Eylem. The singer has been busy creating her own music, mixing her Cypriot roots with her upbringing in London. With several albums, hit singles and awards under her belt, she left her label and struck out on her own. Showcase's Shiraz Ali sat down with Alem on the set of her latest music video to find out where her global journey has taken her. <laughs> Okay, Elam. Actually, is it Elam or Elam? <laughs> it's Elam. Uh, it, it's spelled with an E, but it's pronounced with an A. Okay. I've said that a lot in my life. Can you tell? <laughs> I've got I've, that ready. Yeah, you said that quite abruptly. Spelled with an E, pronounced with an A. It's Elam. <laughs> okay, Elam. Thank you very much for joining us on Showcase. Thank you for having me. It's, it's lovely to see you, Shira. What got you into music? Because you're a singer, you're a songwriter, and you're a performer. Oh, so, how did it all start? Originally, I started with theatre and dance and then music kind of came into my life afterwards. But, I, you know, I got those qualifications. I made sure that I understood what this involved. Uh, but the music side of things, I was in a girl band. We were going to get signed and it was very exciting and it was my first journey in music. And it kind of fell through as, you know, a lot of bands at that time were kind of doing the band thing. At that point, I was already thinking, what does Alem like, you know? And for me, it was representing who I am. So that's, that's what you want to be when you're an artist. And um, I thought, well, I want, I want music that represents me. So I'm going to do my two cultures. So one thing I find quite interesting is that you've gone from signing on being on a label to now being independent and self-produced. It seems like a lot of artists are doing that these days. Is it to do with social media, technology, or what's the reason behind it? Definitely the platforms have changed. You know, it's, it, this is a business at the same time. And even though I still get excited, this is a business and you must look at it in that way. And for that, you need to be smart. You need to change with those platforms. I don't just get up and just sing this song. For me, it's making sure that I'm able to be free artistically. You know, I can, just because there's something's a trend, I'm not going to follow that trend musically. It's got to fit me. And I don't think labels have the passion and they definitely don't have the vision because here we all are, you know, we not, we're not going to be finished till early hours in the morning, but that's fine because this is my baby. Mm -hmm. And the people that are here want from the clothing to the makeup because we believe in this. And I don't think labels actually believe in it as much. They do see it. But yes, I, always say, I also say it is a business, mm -hmm. but being business minded musically as well is very important as much as it is to be you know, artistic and, and I need that freedom. See, and for that, it's, you need to, you need to be, be smart. <laughs> you've lived abroad, you've been brought up abroad and you've been you know, between Cyprus, London and Turkey effectively. Yeah. So how's that influenced your music or your sound? Hugely, yeah, definitely. I, I definitely think that was the, the inspiration behind me starting my own, my own sound, my own identity as an artist and, and a lot of people could relate to it and I think that's why the success kind of happened straight away because I've got a lot of following in Germany and uh, Holland and all European countries and we, because people can relate to the fact that 
you know, we're born in a different country, but we're actually our root and our, our origin is still in our soul. And I wanted my music to kind of represent that. <laughs> Uh, going back to your melodies and writing, do you remember writing your first song and the feeling of that, or like who you performed to, for example? Oh wow, uh, yeah, I, I think Aman, obviously, was my first baby. There's no word in Turkish that says shake all your worries, but that is a translation for shake all your worries. So uh, I actually used to use that word, so anytime I would be upset, I would go to a dance class to shake all my worries. Because you can't really take a worry or a, sh or a stress and physically shake it. Maybe stress, Taylor Swift heard you as well, you know? shake it off, right? Shake it off, right, exactly, same inspiration. Where does your inspiration come from for your music? Is it personal? Is it stuff you, like things you see around or watch something? See, uh, I've got to say before, it was literally uh, watching and listen to you know friends complain about certain things. So you're the shoulder, they cry. Yeah, yeah. I'd be like, listen, absorbing all that kind of raw emotions. Uh, but now I don't know. I do write a little bit more personal. I definitely uh, take a bit of, of of what I'm going through and apply that into my writing um, sessions. Definitely, and you need that. It's, it's coming into your life for a reason. So that lesson will be taken and will be put into a song. Uh, going to your music video today, we're on location here yeah. in, in Bakos, Bakos in, yeah. in Istanbul. So uh, in this fine, lovely weather, yeah. it's a bit cold. Oh, it's looks. fine. <laughs> we're 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 not cold at all. <laughs> Tell me a bit more about this one. It's very sort of young and upbeat and um, a lot of dance, and it's quite cool. This one, there's there's a lot of like uh, you know you could you could let's see this and think oh actually it's um a modern style music video um, but I think it fits the song because it's quite um, a cocky kind of song a little bit kind of like a, you know he's done me wrong so what's next for you is it an album is it a single very very exciting times where I've missed the stage and when I'm on that stage I become Alum still but still uh, someone that comes alive in a different form so uh, for me getting on that stage is mean coming alive, you know? <laughs> you mentioned you come alive on stage. Yeah. So you're obviously a different persona like many artists and singers. Yeah. But how would your best friend or someone close to you describe you? That's, that's a great question. I'm have to call, can I call a friend? <laughs> <laughs> you call a friend? <laughs> Ask the audience. Friend. <laughs> I don't, um, I don't, I'm definitely an emotional person, I am. Um, but I like to think that I'm business-minded too because you need to be, especially if you're creating yourself. So, but I'm definitely excited. I'm an excited person, as you can tell. You know, I'm excited about what I'm doing and I'm excited about life. Because you have to, it's your own. You're given one life and you've got to thank God and, and, and be grateful for everything. And just, um, I'll definitely say that I'm a person full of gratitude and, and love. So you're and humble I, then? Oh, absolutely. I am definitely, I'm, that's just, the calmer you are, the more grateful you are, I think everything falls into place. So definitely like to think positive. <laughs> Caleb, thank you very much for joining us again on Showcase. Thank you so much. I want to thank you and thank you for Showcase also for being part of our filming day today. It's been wonderful. Thank you to you and the crew and to TRT World. And not long after a beloved elephant named Dumbo returned to the big screen, now it's the genie's turn. The latest film incarnation of Aladdin recently had its world premiere in Europe. But as the press junkets for the film are taking place across the Middle East, fans and critics alike wonder how this version is tackling some of the controversies caused by its predecessors. Come with us and enter a whole new world beyond your imagination. Disney Studios' 1992 musical Aladdin became the company's biggest moneymaker that year, earning the studio more than $500 million. But the highly acclaimed animation did raise eyebrows for its stereotypical depiction of Middle Eastern countries. 
And on top of this, some of the lyrics of the set piece musical numbers featured in the movie were found offensive by set geography inhabitants. We'll just see about that. You stumbled upon an opportunity. Now, Disney is going back to the fertile well in the desert once again with the remake of this blockbusting classic. The story finds orphaned street urchin Aladdin take on the evil Grand Vizier with a little help from the genie and the lamp. Makers of the film assure fans that this time around that the movie has the best of intentions when it comes to cinematic representations of its locations. I'm kidding. Watch this. I spent a lot of time in the, in the Middle East and um, the experiences that I have and have had in the Middle East, you don't see on, on commercials and on television in the, in the United States. So for me, it's a big part of uh, being able to uh, show and expose the, the, the beauty of the region uh, to the world. After this affirmation, there is still one question that lingers. Will Will Smith? the co-lead playing the Ginny, be able to fill in comedian Robin Williams's shoes, who gave life to the larger-than-life character previously. Will's principal concern was making sure he didn't uh, disturb the nostalgia and the brilliance, essentially, of Robin Williams' performance. Um, so my job was really to encourage Will to be more Will. Mm. Um, which I found to be, you know, it, it, it was one step to the left or one step to the right of, of where Robin was. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, needless to say, I'm a big fan of Will. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, I, I, I was there to encourage more of that. You look like a prince on the outside. But I didn't change anything on the inside. This retelling of the 1992 version of Aladdin may come with the best intentions of not repeating the mistakes of the original, but the feature has already caused waves of controversy, with social media pointing out that its white cast members were painted brown to make them look like locals. Thanks for joining us, and if you're looking for more of Showcase's coverage of the global art scene, you can find it on our YouTube channel. But before we go, let's visit the Statue of Liberty. American poet Emma Lazarus once ascribed these words to the mother of exiles. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And now, a museum on New York's Ellis Island is raising questions about the meaning of freedom in America today. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.
level man, the tougher, the better.